Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and for those of you who might have wandered into the wrong room, I'm John Podesta. Uh, I'm going to speak for a few minutes, uh, and then I'm going to take some questions uh, from, the, from the press. Uh, but I want to start by recognizing our wonderful ambassador to Azerbaijan, Mark Libby, who's uh, sitting up here in the front row. We have a big team. Jane Nasheed is here from uh, EPA. We have my colleagues from uh, SPEC. Uh, and I want to also acknowledge uh, the hard work and the professionalism of the Azerbaijan uh, COP team, uh, led by uh, Minister Babiev, as COP29 comes to order. So I want to address tonight a topic that is on everyone's mind, the U.S. election. For those of us dedicated to climate action, last week's outcome in the United States is obviously bitterly disappointing, particularly because of the unprecedented resources and ambition President Biden and Vice President Harris brought to the climate fight. Starting with our bold 2030 NDC to cut emissions uh, by 50 to 52 percent below 25, 2005 levels, by rejoining Paris, by making the largest investment in climate and clean energy in history through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. The President's commitment to quadruple international climate funds from the United States to $11 billion per year. It's clear, it is clear that the next administration will try to take a U-turn and, re and reverse much of this progress. And of course, I'm keenly aware of the disappointment that the United States has, has at times caused the parties of the climate regime who have lived through a pattern of strong, engaged, effective U.S. leadership, followed by sudden disengagement after a U.S. presidential election. And I know that this disappointment is more difficult to tolerate as the dangers we face grow ever more catastrophic. But that is the reality. In January, we're going to inaugurate a president whose relationship to climate change is captured by the words hoax and fossil fuels. He's vowed to dismantle our environmental safeguards and once again withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement. That is what he has said, and we should believe him. The United States is a democracy, and in a democracy, the will of the people prevail. Our administration is working with the incoming administration to ensure a peaceful and orderly transition of power. But what, what I want to tell you today is that while the United States federal government under Donald Trump may put climate action on the back burner, the work to contain climate change is going to continue in the United States with commitment and passion and belief. As President Biden said in the Rose Garden last week, setbacks are unavoidable, but giving up is unforgivable. This is not the end of our fight for a cleaner, safer planet. Facts are still facts. Science is still science. The fight is bigger than one election, one political cycle, in one country. This fight is bigger uh, still, because we are all living through a year defined by the climate crisis in every country of the world. July 22nd was the hottest day in recorded history. The consequences of living on a rapidly warming planet are all around us, and not just in collapsing coral reefs and melting ice she uh, sheets. It's had devastating impact on people's lives. This fall, Hurricane Helene and Milton slammed into the southeastern United States, killing hundreds and cutting off power and water in communities for weeks. The worst drought in decades in southern Africa is putting 20 million children at risk of malnutrition and even starvation. Wildfires and drought are ravaging the Amazon and the Pantanel, destroying indigenous communities and burning up an area the size of Switzerland. Catastrophic floods in Spain just two weeks ago poured a year's worth of rain in a single day. In Asia, in September, supercharged Typhoon Yagi killed hundreds and caused 16 billion dollars in damages from the Philippines to Myanmar. None of this is a hoax. It is real. It's a matter of life and death. Fortunately, many in our country and around the world are working to prepare the world for this new reality and to mitigate the most catastrophic effects 
of climate change. From day one, President Biden and Vice President Harris built a climate team to work with partners around the world to build strong, sustainable, equitable economies. We sought to open up finance for developing economies to accelerate their own clean energy transitions. We saw a gap between clean energy supply and anticipated demand and sought to close it. And our global partners know that addressing the climate crisis also bolsters their own national security and global security while creating jobs, new industries, and new opportunities. The United States has been the world's partner in these efforts for four years. That remains our mission. For example, the Inflation Reduction Act is unleashing a clean energy boom in America that's boosting innovation and lowering costs for clean energy technology by as much as 25%. That helps speed deployment of clean energy, not just in the U.S., but across the globe, slashing emissions everywhere. As a result, the Rhodium Group found that for every ton of carbon pollution in America, cut reduced in America because of the IRA, it will drive reductions of up to 2.9 tons outside the United States. The historic investments under President Biden and Vice President Harris have crucially been government-enabled but private sector-led. In total, just since the President took office, American companies have announced more than $450 billion in new clean energy investments. Here at COP29 and moving forward, the private sector must continue to lead to make new and bigger investments in clean energy technologies, to continue to innovate and build a net zero economy. And we will continue to need subnational actors in the U.S. and globally to lead the way. In the wake of COP22 in Marrakesh and President Trump's decision in 2017 to pull the United States out of the Paris Agreement, the We Are Still In movement was born in the United States. It has now grown into the most expansive coalition ever assembled in support of U.S. climate action, with more than 5,000 states, businesses, local governments, tribal nations, universities, and more. And this year's COP, we expect to see representation from many of these leaders, as well as several states and cities, and a bipartisan group from the U.S. Congress. Because support for clean energy has become bipartisan in the United States. You might not know that by reading the newspapers, but it has. 57% of new clean energy jobs created since the Inflation Reduction Act passed are located in congressional districts represented by Republicans. Those jobs come from over 350 new clean energy projects, totaling $286 billion in investments. Many Republicans, especially governors, know all of this activity is a good thing for their districts, states, and uh, for their economies. Governor uh, Henry McMaster of South Carolina, uh, Governor Kevin Stitt in Oklahoma, for example, have welcomed clean energy investments for many years, from the EV supply chain uh, to the solar supply chain. And earlier this year, 18 House Republicans wrote a letter to Speaker Mike Johnson urging him not to repeal the IRA's clean energy tax credits. The le letter says a full repeal would create a worst-case scenario where we would have spent billions of taxpayer dollars and received next to nothing in return. It's beca precisely because the IRA has staying power that I'm confident that the United States will continue to reduce emissions, benefiting our own country and benefiting the world. The economics of clean energy transition have simply taken over. New power generation is going to be clean. The desire to build out next generation nuclear is still there. Farmers and ranchers are reducing emissions and raising their incomes through more efficient and biologic fertilizers, biodigesters, and feed additives. The hyperscalers are still committed to powering the future with clean energy, including safe, reliable nuclear energy. The auto companies are still investing in electrification and hybridization. All those trends are not going to be reversed. Are we facing new headwinds? Absolutely. But will we revert back to the energy system of the 1950s? No way. 
and we have only one administration at a time. Until late January, President Biden and Vice President Harris will still be in the White House. So we're at he here at COP29 conti to continue to work together with our global partners and other parties. The COP is a critical opportunity to cement our progress and keep 1.5 degrees alive, to accelerate progress on reducing all greenhouse gases, and perhaps most notably, to strengthen global cooperation on adaptation and climate finance. We are here to work, and we are committed to a successful outcome at COP29. We can and make, will make real progress on the backs of our climate-committed states and cities, our innovators, our companies, and our citizens, especially young people who understand more than most that climate change poses an existential threat that we cannot afford to ignore. Failure or ap apathy is simply not an option. Today is a day across much of the world that we remember those who were willing to pay the ultimate price to build a more peaceful world. In the United States, it's Veterans Day, a day to honor all those who answered our country's highest call to service, to whom we owe not just our eternal gratitude, but truly our freedom. We owe it to them and to all people who care about the future of this planet to make the most of these next two weeks and to make sure we have a successful outcome. With that, I'm going to take some questions from uh, the press. And uh, I've got an order uh, to start with. I'm going to start with Sarah uh, Sh uh, Schoenhardt from ED News. Hi, thank you so much for taking questions. Thank you for addressing us. Um, the US role is arguably diminished at COP this year because of the election. I'm curious. What do you see as the main goal for the U.S. at this COP, and how do you plan to achieve that? Look, we've, we've been working very hard with the COP presidency and with our uh, colleagues across the world uh, on a range of issues. Uh, tomorrow, we're, for example, co-hosting uh, with China and Azerbaijan a summit uh, on methane and other non-CO2 gases to uh, reduce what is uh, sometimes not, not uh, as uh, much attention paid to, but fully causes half of greenhouse, uh, of global warming. Uh, so we will continue uh, to encourage people uh, to work uh, diligently to come up with a new uh, funding form formula uh, through the new uh, cumulative quantified goal. We, uh, we've been, I was here at the pre-COP just a couple of weeks ago. We're continuing those discussions. It needs to be realistic, but we think we can get that done here. Uh, we're making progress on finally finishing uh, Article 6. Uh, and we're working, I think, on uh, important outcomes that build on the success uh, in uh, the Dubai consensus, uh, particularly in the area of uh, uh, energy deployment, tripling renewables, that's going to take more effort, including uh, building out uh, battery storage, building out grids, and uh, the outcome document of this COP hopefully will point the world in the right direction on that. So there's still uh, plenty of work to do. Our team is here uh, to make sure that work gets done. Uh, Justin Ro Rowlett from BBC. Oh, yeah, of course, the mic. Thank you, Mr. Podesta. Mr. Podesta, is there an opening for China to take leadership on the climate issue? Well, look, uh, China is now 30 percent of global emissions. They're the largest emitter in the world, uh, nearly. Uh, uh, and uh, they uh, have an obligation. As you know, we've been engaged with them over a long period of time. In my case, that goes back to uh, dialogues that I had with the uh, uh, senior levels of the Chinese government in advance of 2014, when President Obama and President Xi uh, announced jointly their uh, nationally determined commitments and gave life to and, I think, helped really propel uh, action that led to the Paris Agreement. But as the world's largest emitter, they have an obligation uh, to take account of 
uh, what occurred uh, in Dubai to come forward with a 1.5 aligned all greenhouse gas economy-wide NDC. Uh, and I'm sure they, they're, they're sending a senior level delegation here. Uh, I mentioned the uh, uh, joint summit we're hosting tomorrow on methane. We've been engaged with them on reducing other uh, uh, non-CO2 gases, including industrial nitrous oxide. Uh, but it is incumbent, if we're going to keep 1.5 within reach, that they come forward with real reductions against what we believe uh, is an economy that's really already peaked emissions. Whether it's this year, next year, or last year, they're in the mid-2020s, uh, they're peaking. They've already hit their 2030 target f uh, for deployment of renewables, uh, which they pledged in 2015, six years ahead of schedule. So I think they can be more ambitious, and I think it will send a powerful signal to the world if, if when they issued their NDC uh, in uh, next year, uh, it is, as I said, 1.5 aligned and shows real reductions from uh, their, their peak. So they have an important role to play, and I hope that they play it. I'm sorry. Uh, Jake Biddle from Grist. Thank you, Mr. Podesta. Uh, on the new collective quantified goal, uh, there are proposals from Canada and Switzerland to enlarge the donor base by including countries with a certain level of GNI or per capita emissions. I'm wondering what the U.S.'s position on those proposals are and if an expanded donor base is a condition for U.S. support of the goal. Look, we, uh, we've felt that, that an expanded donor base has been uh, long warranted. We've argued that in the run-up uh, to COP. Uh, there are capable parties. With, uh, the, this is not 92, uh, excuse me, 1992 in terms of the economic structure of the world. We also we already see men, a number of parties who are providing climate finance, including China, and we think it's time uh, to take account of those can, uh, contributions uh, through their contributions to uh, multilateral development banks and other forms of, of cooperation so that both the quantum is uh, serious uh, and uh, people are, are accountable uh, to make sure, uh, particularly the large emitters, uh, to make sure that developing countries uh, can uh, have the financing they need uh, for both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, Laman Zainalova from Trend. Good to see you again. My question is related to cl uh, climate financing issue. So climate financing has uh, been a real challenge to achieve. And in this regard, especially, it has been a challenge for least developed countries and also small island countries. Which commitments uh, and improvements do you expect to achieve at COP29 in terms of simplifying the access to financing, especially for those countries, in order to help them to adapt and also uh, to uh, to fight climate uh, action? Thank I think so that's much. an extremely important question, and I think one that the United States has been clearly focused on to make sure uh, that uh, the uh, least developed uh, economies, the uh, small island states, other uh, f uh, fragile states have access to climate finance. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the quantum of what, <laughs> from $100 billion up, what's the quantum of the uh, support layer of the NCQG, uh, but there's also very uh, important work that needs to be done uh, to improve access to financing, the so-called qualitative elements uh, of the uh, NCQG. Um, and I think that uh, we've been engaged with international financial institutions, uh, including uh, the climate funds, to make sure that they simplify their processes, that they give uh, the uh, assistance that's necessary to make sure that, that uh, those uh, countries and those economies can, can access those funds. Uh, often, uh, even in where, where there's uh, a capacity uh, to have um, uh, uh, support uh, for uh, the process, the, the process itself 
is so encumbered that particularly smaller countries can't access it. So it's something that we think is a critical element of the negotiations, and hopefully in that, uh, as we move to try to uh, frame the final version of the new uh, NCQG, uh, equal attention will be paid on the qualitative elements so that uh, access is, is for once and for all available uh, across the globe. Um, VJV from The Economist. Uh, hi, th thank you for your comments today. Um, I wanted to ask, in the time you have remaining, uh, what are the most important things that you think you can do to trump-proof your accomplishments uh, by administration and going beyond administrative action as well? Do you think there's a possibility of something like permitting reform, where there is some bipartisan support? Um, is there any chance in the lame duck, or is well, that a dead duck? You know, duck? the Congress is just coming back uh, into town tomorrow. Uh, I think it'll be a topic how both sides sort that out. I think there is uh, support and bipartisan support in the Senate uh, for moving forward uh, with permitting reform. Whether the House decides it wants to take it up, I, I can't speculate uh, standing here today. They've been gone for, for a while, as you know, for the election break. Um, but I think there, there are a number of issues. We're, we're fully committed uh, to trying to uh, award and obligate the funds that were available uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we have uh, already uh, 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 awarded $98 billion. That's about 88 percent of the money that's available in the fiscal years uh, available to us. We're uh, committed to moving forward and, and getting more of that done. Uh, we're also uh, one of the, you know, I wear both hats because I, I, I still sit and, and help drive the uh, domestic implementation of the IRA. We have some important tax guidance. Uh, that needs to be put out, uh, particularly on the uh, carbon, uh, on the uh, technology neutral uh, production and uh, investment tax credits uh, for clean energy production, for clean hydrogen, uh, and a number and a couple of other um, uh, uh, tax credits. So we're fi finalizing those rules, and uh, in the meantime, we're also trying to work, as I said, with our state and local partners. I, as I was walking in uh, to the room, I saw uh, Wade Crowfoot from the state of California, who's here representing uh, the governor. Uh, we're working with them to make sure uh, that we're listening to their needs about uh, what they're trying to uh, get done. Uh, and uh, so we still have plenty of work to do, and we have, I used, I used to know the exact number, but it's around 72 days, I think, uh, to get it done. So my team back in Washington is hard at work ensuring that we uh, solidify uh, the uh, investments that, as I noted, are powering uh, jobs and investment all across the country, north, south, east, west. Uh, and we think uh, that is uh, likely to be uh, one of the best protections uh, for the, uh, the uh, economic uh, incentives that were included uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, but as I said, I think if you look at this from the private sector's perspective, what are they investing in? Where are they going? Power, transportation, uh, even on the industrial side, where uh, as a result of grants that we've been able to make under the bipartisan infrastructure law, there's a serious level of innovation uh, going on to make green steel, to make great green cement. Uh, I don't think that's any of that. Uh, is reversible. Can it be slowed down? Maybe, but it's but the direction is clear. Uh, companies are moving in that direction, and I think they have a lot of support from states, from cities, from other subnational actors uh, to keep going. John, we have time for just one more question. Valerie. Okay, Valerie. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks. Sure. It's okay. Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, Tomorrow there's a focus on methane. Uh, the U.S. has been a leader on global methane action, but without the U.S. at the helm and with uh, companies kind of stepping back with some of their decarbonization goals, you know, where is the accountability going to be? I know there's going to be satellite data coming in, but then where is the uh, accountability for, for those emissions? Look, I think uh, when, uh, when we convene tomorrow, you'll see 
uh, a number of new uh, commitments are coming forward from countries to reduce uh, particularly methane uh, from the oil and gas sector. We've put in place uh, strong rules to do that, uh, and uh, we will fight to make sure that those rules stay in place uh, to reduce, uh, particularly to reduce methane from the oil and gas sector in the U.S. Uh, I think that we're also seeing a lot of interest in trying to uh, work with the United States and with others to reduce waste methane uh, from uh, from uh, b both landfills and from uh, and from wastewater. And so I think that is a place where we can move forward uh, together. And uh, as I noted, I think uh, I was in uh, Beijing in early September, uh, and Lu Jimin, the special envoy for China, was in Washington in the spring. I think our uh, dialogue and technical discussions on reducing all non-CO2 gases has been particularly productive uh, so that we understand each other's uh, strategies and where uh, really um, uh, uh, emissions can be reduced uh, at a very uh, low cost uh, uh, per ton of CO2 equivalent. So I feel good about that. I think you'll see, uh, as I said, tomorrow the World Bank stood up uh, as a result of catalysts from the United States, uh, a fund to help countries uh, particularly decarbonize uh, in their, in their uh, fuel production sectors. So that work is going on across the globe, and I, sus I expect that in the United States it'll, it'll continue. Most of the companies, most of the large majors uh, have uh, pledged to reduce their emissions. We'll, uh, the public will have to hold them to account. Uh, we're just in the, in the uh, uh, throes of finalization of our rules on uh, the uh, setting up the uh, system to uh, cause, uh, to uh, charge fees for, to oil and gas producers uh, for excessive uh, methane uh, production. That was a feature of the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's a place where I think we continue to make progress, uh, and we have strong global partnership from uh, Central Asia. I think you'll hear some uh, words from Azerbaijan on this uh, coming tomorrow. So I won't, I won't preview that, but except to dangle it. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie.